And we are recording. Uh, how you doing, Daryl? I'm doing great, Glenn. It's nice to see you again. It is good to see you, too. This is Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv, brought to you by the Watson Institute uh, for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. And I am with uh, Daryl West, who is uh, Vice President at the Brookings Institution, Director of Government, Governance Programming there, and a former colleague of mine uh, here at Brown, uh, uh, who is uh, the author of this new book. Let me show the audience the book. Uh, Divided Politics, Divided Nation, uh, with the subtitle Hyper Conflict in the Trump Era. Uh, so we're here to talk about the book and about other things. So welcome, Daryl. Thank you. Great introduction. I look forward to our conversation. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I read your book, uh, at least most of it, <laughs> and uh, was struck by, uh, as a guy who myself is struggling with trying to get a memoir draft down on paper, uh, the artful way in which you blended a personal recollections of your own life experience with uh, higher level kind of observations about the political culture of the United States in this time. Uh, you are uh, a guy who comes from a rural community in Indiana, conservative, Presbyterian, religious. Uh, you find yourself with a PhD in political science. You're a professor at Brown University. You're director of the uh, Taubman Center, as I recall, when you were here, were you not a public policy? Yes. Yep, that's exactly now you're right. at Brookings. So, you know, you have seen uh, in your life, uh, uh, both pers personally and professionally, uh, if you will, both sides of the political divide in the country. Um, so I wonder if you talk a little bit about the motivation for writing the book and, uh, you know, before we get down into the, more of the details, kind of the general sense that you have about the state of uh, political division in the country and prospects that we're going to get ourselves through it without another civil war. Well, I wanted to write the memoir just because I've always known I had an unusual background. So as you uh, point out, I grew up on a dairy farm in uh, rural Ohio, right across the uh, border from uh, Indiana. Uh, but then through I beg your pardon. of circumstances, I got a PhD in political science, taught uh, political science for 26 years at Brown University, which is a very liberal uh, campus. So I've lived among both uh, liberal and conservative tribes. And then my immediate family, is even more striking in the sense that I have two sisters who stayed in the rural community uh, where I, I grew up. They're Christian fundamentalists and they love Donald Trump. And then I have a brother who is liberal and gay and he is not a big fan of uh, President uh, Trump. No, I'm surprised to hear that. Uh, always <laughs> are very interesting. <laughs> yeah, wow, okay, so broadly speaking, uh, do you think that uh, this uh, kind of divide, not just in your family, but more broadly, is bridgeable? I mean, are we are we uh, going to be able to work it out somehow? Uh, it's uh, very concerning to me, actually, that uh, there is so much tribalism in our in our politics, and uh, you know, people almost willfully, it seems to me, uh, can't quite put themselves in the other guy's shoes and so forth. No, I agree with that. And I mean, that's the reason I wrote the book, because I'm very concerned about polarization and uh, tribalism. I mean, one of the most stunning statistics that I saw was there was a national public opinion survey that found 50% of Republicans now say they would be really upset if one of their children married a Democrat. Uh, and that compares to like 5% felt that way 50 years ago. Uh, so it's kind of a stunning number just showing how deep that polarization is. There's an economic component, there's a cultural component, there's a, a religious uh, component. And, you know, we have to be careful this doesn't get out of hand. Uh, you made that reference uh, uh, about the Civil War. You know, that was the ultimate in polarization uh, when the country could not resolve the issue of slavery. There were various compromises, they didn't work out, and people took to uh, military means. I don't think we're at that point yet, but it certainly is creating serious problems for our governance. It's raising questions about American democracy and you know, how uh, long it will be able to uh, continue. So we have to take this seriously because you can certainly imagine uh, very bad scenarios coming out of this. Well, if I would have... Um just uh, start trying to make a list of what um, uh, might be the uh, sources of this growing uh, division. 
Um, Donald Trump would be near the top of the list. Uh, is he cause or effect? Is Donald Trump, as it were, the kind of presidential candidate you expect to get in an era of polarization, or is he an event uh, more or less unconnected to uh, the uh, ongoing social dynamics who in his uh, extremity and uh, perversity and, uh, uh, you know, crassness and opportunism and whatnot is uh, provoking it, or, or what do you think? I mean, he certainly is a major contributing factor, but in the book, I say it didn't start with Donald Trump. Uh, the book is a 40-year political history from Reagan to Trump. And as you move from president to a president, from uh, Reagan and uh, Bush to Clinton to George W. Uh, Bush to Barack Obama and uh, now to uh, Trump, you can see the intensity level uh, ramps up almost uh, with each presidency. It's almost like American politics is swinging back and forth like a pendulum, but the swings are getting much uh, wider. Uh, and I think it's probably no accident uh, that we got Donald Trump after our first African-American president. Uh, you know, Obama produced a backlash uh, that, uh, you know, made a Donald Trump uh, possible. Uh, you know, people have pointed to the changing demographic uh, trends in America. Uh, by about 2044, uh, it's estimated that the add up African-Americans, Latinos, and Asian-Americans, uh, they will be a majority. Uh, and there clearly are many white people who see that demographic feature and don't like it, and they are fighting it. Is it as simple as that? I mean, does Obama have some responsibility in uh, the way in which he handled his uh, two terms in office for not delivering? And I'm asking a question here. I don't mean to be making a statement. I really uh, don't have a position on this, but it occurs to me to be at least possible to argue. Uh, that Obama ran in 2008, uh, uh, he says, we're not uh, red America, or blue America, we're one America, not black America or white America. It's in my very DNA, he said. Uh, he, he was a literal personification of bridging the racial divide and the fact that he had a white mother, a black father, et cetera. Um, and yet, uh, if I were to ask uh, Sean Hannity or somebody about the Obama presidency, he's not, an, he's not an unbiased source to be sure. But you know what I mean? The right wing narrative would be he divided the country, bring a gun to a knife fight kind of thing like that. He, he uh, you know, he was uh, as much an uh, active uh, uh, agent in the evolution of the polarized reaction to his presidency as he was a victim of it. Uh, of course, the left will say it was all about uh, not wanting to accept that a black man had uh, been elected to the highest office. But as a matter of fact, if you look at the way that he handled, you know, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I don't want to go on much longer because this is not actually my argument, but I can imagine that some people on the right would say, what? I mean, Obama got uh, as good as he gave and uh, uh, the division, you know, the health care law was passed without a single republic, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I'm asking you, is Obama partly responsible for what we're seeing, not only a victim of it? I mean, I think Obama actually tried to bridge the partisan divide as well as uh, the racial divide in America. I got almost no cooperation from Republicans on that. If anything, he had this almost naive faith that it was possible to uh, bridge <coughs> a gap. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and see that uh, that optimism actually was misplaced. Uh, in the first two years of his presidency, Democrats had super majorities in the House and Senate, but he insisted on trying to negotiate a deal with Republicans. He wanted there to be some Republican support for Obamacare, uh, and in the end, uh, just simply didn't happen. So uh, he actually wasted some valuable time in hopes of, of there being some bipartisanship, but not being able to uh, deliver on that. Um, but I think it's really the attitude of the country at large. Uh, race is not the only source of uh, polarization. There clearly is an economic component and a cultural and religious uh, component as well. But I think we can't ignore the growing demographic changes that are taking place and how disruptive and disorienting uh, that is uh, for uh, certain people in the United States. And so part of our current polarization is a reflection on how people feel about race as well as how they feel about economics and culture. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I entirely agree with that narrative, but, but let's, let's go with it for a minute. So, um, yes, we are 
on our way toward being a majority minority country. When you add up the Asian and uh, Hispanic and African American proportions of the population, uh, and yes, a lot of people are concerned that uh, they're they want their country back, and they are they're disquieted by the changes. Of course, they're not only demographic, as you acknowledge in the book, they are also economic with globalization and uh, people's sense of uh, economic security being undermined. Um, immigration is disruptive. It causes changes in the way that uh, communities uh, have been living, and those things need some uh, getting used to. We're not just seeing that in the United States. We're seeing it. Um, we're seeing it around the around the country. I mean, around the world. Um, but so my but is. Um, I don't. I don't understand why uh, the fact of changing demography has to be perceived as a threat. It, it's not necessarily a threat. I mean, Latinos, for example, are fairly religious population. African Americans are relatively culturally conservative. When you ask people about some of these questions, um, the, the 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 fact of demographic diversity doesn't have to mean an undermining of. Uh, of uh, settled ways of living. Um, I, I can remember some political scientists arguing early in the uh, post uh, Voting Rights Act analysis when people were talking about uh, minority majority congressional districts and so on, writing books about what does it mean uh, for blacks to have effective representation. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, Carol Swain, um, Abigail Thernstrom, uh, people like this, doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be represented by black voters. Uh, um, what am I saying? I'm saying it's going to sound conservative. I'm sorry. I apologize. But I'm saying some people have an interest in defining the political fault lines along demographic lines precisely because they see the numbers moving in a direction that helps uh, the Democrats. But I'm not sure that that's good for the country. And I'm not sure that that's the only way to go. Can't we envision a politics in which uh, uh, racial or ethnic identity is less salient than, I don't know, religious or cultural identity, and some of those religious or cultural commitments might bridge the, the demographic lines in a way that would, would be healthy for American politics. I mean, it certainly does not have to be zero-sum, and I hope that it does not turn out that way, but in a highly polarized and highly tribal world, people are interpreting almost everything in an us versus them mentality. And the them can be racial minorities, it can be immigrants, it can be people of the other party or of a, a differing ideology. I mean, people don't mix that much anymore. I mean, I remember when I grew up, you know, people talked about integration as a way to kind of bring people together and there'd be greater tolerance and understanding that uh, came out of that. You know, we seem to be failing on a lot of those dimensions. and. People are sorting themselves out uh, based on all sorts of things, uh, race, education, income levels, uh, lifestyle, and uh, so on. And so that becomes part of the polarization uh, story. Uh, and it's hard to see, you know, given how uh, deeply rooted uh, that is uh, in the United States right now, you know, what is going to change that in the short run? Hmm. Well, I was struck, you say both of your sisters, they stayed back in uh, the hometown. Uh, are they on the farm? Uh, they uh, live uh, close to uh, where I grew up. So uh, one lives like literally one or two miles away. The other's uh, eight or nine uh, miles uh, from there. I mean, the interesting thing is even though my three siblings and myself have radically different views on uh, politics and religion, Somehow we've managed to keep it together. Like we agreed a long time ago to uh, disagree. Uh, even during the Reagan period, we had uh, pretty sharp uh, differences on uh, politics. Uh, we still see each other. I go back to Ohio at least uh, once a year. You know, we exchange uh, birthday greetings and holiday uh, gifts. But many Americans are not able uh, to do that. Uh, uh, there's another survey that found, I think it was like 16% of Americans now say that they have stopped talking to a family member because of political differences. And Trump clearly has aggravated that because he's raised the stakes uh, and increased the intensity level around uh, political issues. But we're kind of at a point where 
the polarization is not just a political problem, but it's affecting society in general and even family relationships. Okay, well, I have a confession to make. Um, I remarried uh, my wife of 30 years, Linda uh, Lowry, passed away in 2011. And I remarried uh, 18 months ago to a wonderful woman, Lawan uh, Lowry of Houston, Texas. If she sees this, I want her to know that I love her dearly. Um, but uh, <laughs> we don't dis we don't agree about a whole lot politically. I'm not a Trump uh, voter, but I am much more open to some of the conservative uh, policy arguments. I am an economist after all. I can't, uh, what can I tell you? Uh, you know, I'm not sure that the tax bill was the worst thing in the world. I'm not sure that uh, uh, talking tough with China is going to bring the uh, economic globalization to a halt given all the different complex strategic considerations that are at play. I'm aware of inequality, but uh, I, I think when she says that the CEO makes 200 times what the line worker makes, I ask her, what does the guy who sells popcorn in the stadium make relative to the guy who's sinking baskets on the court? And why does that ratio mean anything to me, et cetera, et cetera? She's a liberal Democrat. <laughs> So you have interesting uh, family discussions, too, it sounds like. <laughs> so, yeah, it could get kind of heated at times and it could get, you know, it, it puts a strain on the relationship, although we are we're, we're doing just fine. We're doing fine. Um, another story. Uh, do you know William Julius Wilson, the uh, distinguished sociologist at Harvard? Is an yes, yeah, he actually spoke at Brookings uh, about a year or so. Yeah, he's, very yeah he's, he's a great man. He's one of the leading sociologists of his generation, uh, books about uh, poverty in uh, American cities and race and so on. Anyway, Bill Wilson's daughter is a Trump voter. Wow. That's when shocking. I learned that. It must be shocking for him. <laughs> and the strains are really, really, really strong because he is a, not just a liberal Democrat. He's a, he's a social Democrat in the old school European sense of the term. Yeah, I mean, definitely. He's got to have an awfully hard time with that. And I'm sure this is being played out in place. So what, what's to be done? On their conversation sometime. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is to be done? Um, and uh, your brother, uh, uh, Ken, is that his name? Yes, yes. Yeah, Ken. So Ken is gay. You tell the story. Why don't you share with the audience uh, the story in the book about Ken's coming, quote unquote, coming out and uh, how you and your mother and your siblings, your uh, sisters received that uh, news and so forth. Well, I found out uh, many years ago, I think it was at a uh, Thanksgiving uh, reunion. Uh, where he kept, somebody kept calling him and he was running to the phone and very excited and having uh, these conversations. So it was obvious there was a love interest on the other side. Yeah. And remember later when uh, the two of us were uh, by ourselves, I asked him, well, what is she like? And there was a long pause on his end. And then finally he said, what makes you think it's a she? <laughs> And it was that, and then there was a long pause on my end as I kind of comprehended uh, that I never thought about him uh, or anyone else uh, being uh, gay. This was uh, many years ago, and that is basically how I uh, knew. And uh, later, uh, I was on sabbatical at Oxford University, and my mother came over to uh, visit us, and we turned on the television and happened to be an Oprah Winfrey uh, show about gay couples adopting children. And I'm thinking, oh, no, because my brother had never told my mother that he was uh, gay, uh, even though he lived with a guy and you know, they uh, did a lot of traveling together, but it had not been an object of conversation. So we're watching this show, and at one point, my mother basically says, well, uh, do you think Ken and Tom are gay? And I gulped at that point, and, of course, uh, remembering the old uh, line about it's the messenger who ends up uh, getting uh, killed, I decided if my brother wanted to tell her uh, the news, it was uh, he could uh, do that. He had not uh, done that. So I decided I would not be the one to break the news to her. And she went to her grave not ever having a conversation with him about that, although over time it became pretty clear what the situation was. But it just wasn't something that she wanted to confront. Uh, I'm sure it would have been difficult for her to handle. Uh, but, you know, that's one of those cultural and lifestyle issues that is uh, difficult in some families now. 
Well, so she never actually knew, although at some she level kind of she knew, probably but did never know. really wanted to acknowledge it. It was unspeakable. Yes, it, it was not something she really wanted uh, to get into, I, I think. And your sister uh, didn't attend the wedding when uh, uh, Ken and his partner finally wed. Yeah, a few years ago, uh, they got married in Washington, D.C., because it uh, was not legal in Florida, uh, where they uh, live. And one sister came to the wedding, uh, the other uh, did uh, not. And it's been an issue in the family in the sense that all four of us uh, get along. And if one kind of looked at us from outside, one would not see any issues. But both of my sisters are very religious. They're fundamentalist in their beliefs. They both uh, believe uh, that being homosexual runs contrary to the Bible and the word of God. And so they say, I've heard them say on many occasions, that uh, they love my brother, uh, but they differ with him on religious uh, grounds and think that his lifestyle is not consistent with uh, being a Christian. Yeah. Uh, speaking of religion, uh, you know, I was really struck uh, when I was reading in your book about how in your uh, hometown, uh, the Supreme Court's decision on uh, prayer in schools was uh, perceived as just kind of incomprehensible, incongruous. I mean, how could it be that you couldn't uh, have a non-secular, you know, non-sectarian prayer to tell kids that, uh, you know, to bless the day and so on? Uh, and the question I want to ask is about the Supreme Court and um, uh, polarization. Uh, I wonder what you think about this uh, argument, which has occurred to me. I don't know enough to be, I'm not an expert on these things, but so Roe versus Wade uh, takes the abortion question out of politics and uh, decides it as a matter of right, a uh, matter of uh, uh, constitutional entitlement, uh, right to privacy and an interpretation of what that means. Um, and I've often wondered whether that isn't at least partly responsible for uh, the rise of the Christian right as a, as a, a factor in American politics, um, and whether we wouldn't be somehow less divided. I, I speak of Roe versus Wade, but what one could think about other uh, Supreme Court decisions. We wouldn't be less divided if we had uh, the capacity to have more flexibility by region and the way in which uh, the state reacted to some of these disputes, rather than taking them out of politics, allow them to be uh, uh, subject to the give and take of political uh, uh, adjudication. And uh, Georgia doesn't have to, or Alabama, uh, have to have the same treatment of abortion as California or New York or Connecticut. Um, and so on. I mean, I, I wonder what you think about the role of democratic deliberation and regional differentiation and being able to tamp down uh, some of the, you know, the rough edges of uh, partisan conflict. So we don't have a give, you know, it doesn't have to be a winner take all kind of uh, situation. Is that make, is what I'm saying making any sense to you? What, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a very important point because I think all of those issues are a big part of the cultural aspect of our current polarization. So that school prayer decision, I think, came down in 1962. Uh, Roe versus Wade came down in uh, 1973. And then the same-sex uh, marriage uh, decision, first in the States and then nationally, came down uh, just in the last few years. And I remember on the school prayer decision, I was pretty young at that point, but it was very traumatic for my community because my community was basically a Christian community. Uh, I actually didn't meet any Jewish Americans, so I went away uh, to uh, college. Uh, and, you know, we routinely, in many of my uh, classes at school, would open uh, the day uh, either with uh, the Lord's Prayer or a Bible story or, you know, something uh, of, of religious uh, instruction, including after that Supreme Court decision. Uh, there was nobody who, in my community, who dissented from that. And my teachers just acted like that decision never took place. But in rural <laughs> America, people basically saw that decision as well as the later abortion decision as kind of throwing a stick of dynamite uh, into uh, the rural heartland. And part of our current cultural polarization really dates back to that. And you can see, you know, the pitch battles that we now have over Supreme Court 
nominees, in part it's because of these cultural issues and kind of the differing views that liberals and conservatives have about the role of uh, the Supreme Court. So the, that long history kind of percolated over a long period of time, but ended up mobilizing the Christian right, uh, the moral majority, and other uh, like uh, groups. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, every time there is a mobilization in one direction, there almost always is a counter-revolution in the opposite direction, and abortion uh, kind of illustrates that point. I want to talk a little bit also uh, about uh, your experience here at Brown University, um, which, where you served on the faculty for many years. And you write about in the book some of the um, identity politics conflicts that played themselves out on the university. The early Me Too uh, uh, outburst here of uh, women objecting to uh, the date rate problem, uh, speakers who would come to campus and not be uh, uh, received as warmly as they might have expected uh, because they had uh, views at, at odds with the consensus uh, perception of the of the student body here. You were not here when the Ray Kelly incident happened in 2013. I think you had left right. shortly before then. Yeah, that was uh, after I uh, left. But I your successor and talk to some of my former colleagues about that. Um, your successor, my colleague and friend Marion Orr, uh, ended up at the center of a. Uh, he's a political scientist who took over as director of the Taubman Inst uh, Center for uh, Study of American Institutions here at Brown and invited the commissioner of police, Ray Kelly, from New York City to come here and speak. Ray Kelly came up here intending to give a speech defending the practice of racial profiling, although he wouldn't have called it racial profiling. Of course, he would have just called it uh, proactive policing, I think was his phrase, stop and frisk uh, in New York City, uh, which is very unpopular in many quarters and some courts have found to be inconsistent with the, uh, you know, with the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or whatever. Uh, and he wasn't permitted to speak, and it became a, a source of big controversy here on campus. Um, uh, reports were written and, you know, speeches were given and so forth and so on. Uh, but uh, in general, do you think that Brown, of course, has this reputation of being this preciously politically correct hothouse of trendy liberalism, this and that and the other? Is that a, do you think, both about Brown specifically, but more generally about elite higher education. Is that a bad rap? Uh, do you think that the, the professoriate and, and, and the administrative uh, classes here in these uh, Ivy League and other institutions have uh, partly been responsible for uh, polarization? I mean, how, how do you see the, uh, that debate fitting into the larger uh, narrative that you're, that you're developing in your book? Well, I think it is an accurate rap in the sense that I remember there were surveys of Brown University undergraduates, and you know Brown is an ultra liberal place. The surveys showed that uh, more than seventy percent of the undergraduates identified either as Democrat, Green Party, or outright uh, socialist. Only five percent identified themselves as being Republican. So you know skewed much more in a liberal direction than for the country as a whole. And I write about the experiences of Brown because they're actually quite relevant for today where we see the progressive left rising in influence in the Democratic Party. And you know, there's kind of a debate emerging between the Democratic centrists and the Democratic left up to the 2020 election. And as I listen to those debates, I hear echoes of many of my experiences at Brown. Uh, and one of the points I try and make in the book, having grown up in a very conservative area and then teaching at a very liberal university is worrying about extremism on both sides. You know, there's conservative authoritarianism. There's also liberal authoritarianism. Uh, my favorite example was uh, when New York Times uh, columnist Tom Friedman came to a campus to give a talk about globalization and a student just went up on campus and threw a pie in his face. And because they were enterprising Brown University students, of course, they recorded it, and it's still available on YouTube for people who are interested in seeing that. But it's just kind of illustrative of how, and we saw this on occasion after occasion, that when uh, uh, more conservative speakers, even moderate uh, Democratic uh, speakers, would come to campus, there'd be protests, there'd be rallies, there'd be protests, pies in the face, uh, in the case of Ray Kelly, actually not letting him uh, speak. And so I think it's something we have to be aware of because I believe 
after 2020, we actually may be entering a period where uh, the left is going to become very strong. And we just have to be careful that we don't get the downside of that, kind of the lack of tolerance uh, that I hate on the, the right side, uh, but I also am not a big fan uh, on the left side. Either. Does that mean you're predicting Democrats prevail in the 2020 elections? I mean, it's hard to say because we don't know who the candidates are going to be, but I think the political climate is ripe in the sense that just as Obama gave us Trump, there's a possibility Trump may give us a very progressive president and a very progressive uh, Congress. Uh, just because oftentimes we're seeing this pendulum move uh, back and forth, uh, and that would be perfectly consistent, that all of the extremism of Trump, the, 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 uh, the rude uh, rhetoric uh, insulting uh, people, it's really mobilized the, the left. Uh, and, and I applaud that. You know, I'm not a uh, Trump uh, fan. Uh, but we just have to be careful that we don't go overboard and kind of empower uh, kind of the intolerant side of the left, which is part of what is out there. Do you consider the push for impeachment uh, from the left in Congress to be part of this uh, uh, problem, quote unquote? I, I do. Uh, and I personally think it would be a mistake to impeach Trump. It's not that he hasn't done bad things and probably, you know, I, uh, on any fair basis, there certainly is a uh, valid argument uh, that he's uh, crossed the line on obstruction of uh, justice uh, as, as well as other things. But I think politically, what impeachment would do for Trump would be to rally his conservative base in the same way in 1998, the impeachment of Bill Clinton uh, rallied the Democratic base, led to Clinton having a 70% job approval rating and Democratic gains in that off-year election in 1998. Uh, and so I think there are other courses of action. Democrats certainly should be uh, investigating the president, engaging in fact finding. I mean, just trying to find out what has been going on uh, for the last two years, just so we can have a good documentary record of uh, what happened. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's better for the country if we decide the Trump issue through an election as opposed to through impeachment. What do you say to those, and I actually uh, have a good deal of sympathy for this view, who say that um, a lot of people simply couldn't accept the outcome of the 2016 election. A uh, guy got elected uh, without the popular vote through the Electoral College. Uh, he's a bad guy for all the reasons that a lot of people think he's a bad guy. And um, then he comes in and he's starting to act like he's a legitimate president, not my president. Uh, Let's get him out of office. I mean, uh, from day one, a lot of people had, did they not, as their objective uh, to, in effect, negate, uh, annul the uh, expression of, uh, of uh, electoral sentiment that led to Trump being installed in office. Uh, don't those people, that is the people who had absolute contempt for the part of the country that supported Trump, the people who said there is no such thing um, as a good Trump uh, voter, people who call people racist for supporting him and so forth, don't they have, as it were, some uh, blood on their hands, some of the responsibility for uh, the state which we find ourselves in? Was that election not, notwithstanding the external uh, efforts of uh, Russia and others, a legitimate procedure that installed this man as president? Is he not our president, uh, et cetera? Uh, what, do, what do you think about that kind of argument? One of the reasons we're in the pickle that we're in is because a lot of people simply didn't respect the democratic process that led to Donald J. Trump being elected president of the United States. I mean, Trump was very clever in understanding the economic pain that was out there, especially in the heartland, those Midwestern states that uh, put him over uh, the top. I mean, he kind of got that message of those average people who were struggling, who had not you know, seen a, a meaningful wage increase in uh, 30 years and how uh, difficult their circumstances were, and he spoke to that. I think the difficulty in 2016 is when you have uh, somebody who wins the Electoral College but not the popular vote, and the fact that this now is the second time this has happened in 16 years, it creates a bit of a legitimacy gap for the system as a whole. The thing I worry about is this actually could become quite common in uh, the future. Uh, I talk about uh, kind of uh, the geographic inequities, uh, uh, 
uh, where right now 15% of American counties generate 64% of the country's GDP. Uh, and so it's basically the East Coast, the West Coast, and a few metropolitan areas in between where all the economic activity is taking place, where the job growth is, and where there's a viable future. Much of America is not sharing in that. But because of the Electoral College, they have a means to express their discontent. You know, we could end up in a situation where the prosperous parts of America have 30 senators in 15 states, and the not very prosperous parts have 70 senators. That will be a constitutional crisis. We could have Trumpism on steroids in that type of situation. So in the book, I basically say we have to get rid of the Electoral College because that is an archaic institution that's going to allow uh, uh, rural America to have much greater influence than is warranted by the actual numbers of people. Wow. Wow is warranted uh i can see an argument saying that the framers knew good and well that uh, when they established the electoral college they were creating an anti-democratic uh, at least mildly anti-democratic process and they did it for good and sufficient reason uh, and i could see some people saying i might even subscribe to this uh being governed by uh, coastal elites uh, in these centers of economic uh, dynamism uh is uh going to be a, a very difficult pill to swallow for uh, and, and to change the Constitution. How are you going to get rid of the Electoral College? You know, you're going to call a constitutional convention? I mean, good luck with that. Uh, you, that's, that's, you don't know what's going to come out of that. Everything's on the table if you do that. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure what the way forward is. Uh, uh, how, how do you... Uh, uh, envision a, any kind of uh, legitimate process bringing about the outcome of uh, of uh, eliminating the Electoral College? Well, I think people are going to have to think big. And the one thing I like about Trump is the guy actually thinks big. Now, he's thinking big in ways that I don't personally like, but I think he challenges the rest of us to think big uh, in an equal uh, sort of way. And I like to give the example of 100 years ago when America was moving from an industrial to, excuse me, moving from an agrarian to an industrial economy. And it was very difficult. There's a lot of conflict. You know, workers were getting shot on the front lines and so on. And it took decades to work through those social and economic changes. But we did big policy changes, Social Security, unemployment compensation, added an income tax uh, to the uh, Constitution. But there also were a bunch of governance reforms. You know, that's when women got the right to vote. So we doubled the size of the electorate. We moved to direct popular election of senators. I mean, there were a number of constitutional amendments that helped improve governance and put the country on a path to actually what turned out to be a successful effort at industrialization. And I think today, as we're moving to a digital economy, it's raising equal kinds of stresses and strains, uh, we've forgotten about our ability to amend the Constitution. Uh, we think it's too hard, it's too uh, difficult, and people don't even think about that. Uh, we have forgotten about our ability to imagine new types of social programs or new types of taxation. But 100 years ago, we did all those things. So I think we need to recapture that imagination because our challenges are big and it's going to require equally big solutions. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling here because my wife and I just watched Ken Burns' uh, documentary on prohibition, uh, on the uh, movement leading to the enactment of the amendment prohibiting uh, uh, alcohol and then of the failure of that regime and the, the movement to repeal it. And uh, yeah, that was a time of ferment, that's for sure. A lot of stuff was going on. Not all of it was uh, good or wise. And I imagine we'd have to be uh, alert to the same kind of Possibility. I haven't mentioned the press. We only have a few minutes left. Um, uh, I, I was an, amused by your recollection of your interview with Roger Ailes. Uh, what was the uh, what was the auspices of that, and and how did uh, how did Roger handle it? I mean, we have uh, board meetings at uh, Brookings, so we often have high profile speakers who uh, come. And for some crazy reason, somebody had the really crazy idea of having me interview Roger Ailes before the entire Brookings Board of uh, Trustees. 
uh, and that was a challenging assignment. This is probably the most difficult uh, interview that I've ever had, but it turned out to be interesting in the sense that I'd done my homework, and you know, in that type of situation, you can't just ask predictable questions because then you get predictable uh, answers. And so, yeah. I raised the issue of immigration and the pathway to citizenship, knowing that Fox has been a big opponent of that, and you know, they blatantly played to anti-immigrant uh, sentiment. Uh, but I also knew that Rupert Murdoch, Roger Ailes' bo boss, uh, the owner of uh, Fox uh, News, was actually a proponent of immigration reform. I mean, he and Michael Bloomberg had a coalition where they were trying to encourage immigration reform. So the way I raised this issue with uh, Ailes was not to say, you know, what's your view on immigration reform, because I knew how we would answer that. I basically said kind of the equivalent of, your boss supports immigration reform and a pathway to citizenship. How do you feel about it? And that <laughs> put it in more of a box because he either had to be anti-immigrant or anti-boss. And it was an off-the-record <laughs> conversation, so you know, maybe his boss never would have heard uh, what he uh, said. But he gave a long answer, but in the end, he actually came out and said that he favored a pathway to citizenship under particular circumstances. Had this been an open event with news coverage, like that would have been a headline. You know, the head of Fox News supports a pathway to a citizenship. But because it was a closed event, he uh, there, there was not any uh, news coverage. The fact that he's deceased uh, kind of ends the, uh, the confidentiality of, of that uh, discussion. So I reported it in my book. I see. Do uh, you think the press is playing a helpful or, or a harmful role in the partisan uh, divide problem? Or harmful, definitely. Both the traditional news media and, and also social media. I mean, social media is just aggravating tensions, extremism, contributing uh, to the polarization. But, you know, the news media is quite uh, polarized just in the way they cover things. I mean, sometimes, you know, I'm flipping back and forth between uh, CNN, uh, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, and it's like they're describing different realities. Like people have their own facts there. I often have had conversations with my sisters where they'll say something and I'll say, well, where did you hear that? And oftentimes it's uh, Fox News, but you know, they're reporting information as facts that I think are not factual in that nature. So the news media are a big part of the polarization. It's increasingly leading us to view opponents as enemies. It's giving people their own set of facts. And our political system cannot really survive in the long run if everybody has their own facts. You close with the suggestion that we take a liberal or a conservative to lunch. I thought that was cute. I don't, I don't know why we think that's going to solve the problem. Tell me how you think that's going to solve the problem. I mean, I don't think that's the only way to solve the problem. I also suggest we need basic economic reforms and political uh, governance uh, kinds of reforms. But, but I do believe that polarization is not going to be solved down by politics, and it's not going to be solved down in any top-down way. Polarization developed for a wide variety of reasons over a long period of time. And if there ever is an easing of that polarization, it's going to be a bottom-up type of thing where people are have just had it with those political divisions and both at the political level the societal level but also in terms of people's day-to-day -day lives they are rejecting uh, polarization and so I came up with this admittedly cute thing of take a liberal or conservative uh, to lunch depending on you know what your uh, views are uh, I actually practice that in my own life in the sense that in my family I have uh, regular conversations with people whose views differ from uh, myself. Yeah. Uh, through Facebook, I have gotten re-involved with many high school classmates, some of whom I have not seen in you know, 35 or 40 yeah. years. Most of them are Trump voters because they yeah. stay in uh, rural Ohio. But we've renewed our relationship. You know, I don't agree with them on politics, but I actually value the friendship. And you know, these are people who uh, knew me uh, long ago. And so I think if people start to practice this uh, this idea of not viewing the opponent as an enemy, but trying to engage them and understand them, the country will be better off. And I might add, you could almost you could also take the ultimate step 
and marry somebody on the other side of the political <laughs> Which you did. <laughs> I did it, and I'm happy. <laughs> there you go. It's dividend. It can work out again. <laughs> Daryl, thanks a lot. Daryl West, uh, Vice President and Director of Government's Governance Programming at the Brookings Institution. His new book is called Divided Politics, Divided Nation, Hyperconflict in the Trump Era. I really appreciate your time. I know you've got to go. So thank you very much, Daryl. Glenn, thank you very much. Enjoyed the conversation.